Humana's story is the story of humanity, one person at a time. We believe each person has a story to tell, and each story shapes that person into who they are today. Collectively, and more importantly, each and every person's story shapes this little blue rock we call home. We are all together whether we like it or not. We also believe that your unique story might just help someone else traveling down your pathway in life. You might be their guide through this rough time. We are always looking for more exciting stories to share with the world. If you've got one, come share it with us today. Still, it sounds cool. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of Humana Stories, Coffee with Humana Story, episode 36. I'm joined by Johnny Bravo, and if you'd like to join in on the conversation as well, simply log in to our Humana Story live thread, give us your best shot. If they're good, I'll read them on the air. If they're bad, Johnny Bravo will read them on the air. Coffee with Humana Story is the unscripted show where... The theme is created by members for members and involves Humana Story members from around the world. We have a poor unfortunate soul in our sights today, Mark Sargent, and we've decided to make every Friday a flat Friday. And we're going to start from the very beginning with the very basic of questions to understand exactly what flat earth is. And as we take this journey, you can take it with us. And if you can't find the show, you're probably using a post-it note in the underwater caves somewhere off-grid. But more importantly, the more you weigh, the harder you are to kidnap. So eat more pork and beans. Callers can call in at 1-619-798-6307 if you're in the San Diego area. If you're not... You can always Skype us at Humana Story, H-U-M-A-N-A-S-T-O-R-Y, for a worldwide connection. If you're having trouble using a phone and you don't know how to use a computer, you can always Twitter comments live at Humana Story. We have a new show coming out, Reading with Humana Story. The show will air every Saturday at noon, and the conversation about the show will air every Monday on Coffee with Humana Story at 7.30 in the morning. So let's go ahead and dive right on in. I've got Speedy Gonzalez here. Actually, I have Mark Sargent here. And I've got Johnny Bravo, who is Mark Emke. And I threw two Marks in there to throw you guys off, because I know, I know, it'll get really confusing really quick. So, how you doing, Mark? And Mark? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Okay, so the idea of this show is real simple. Aside from saying you're a nut job, we're going to go past all this. And you're going to, A, by the end of all these episodes that we do every Friday, convince me that there is a flat earth, or B, well, I'll love you anyway, because I like to think of you as a friend. So let's start from the very beginning. Mark. No, the other Mark. That would be Johnny Bravo. That'd be Mark Emke, the co-host. Hello. There's Johnny. Okay, so <laughs> let's uh let's start from the very beginning. Flat Earth. What is it? You're asking me what is flat Earth? Oh, yeah, I'm not asking him. Are you kidding me? You it want to is... hear his answer? Hold on. Hey, Mark, what's it? What's what's flat Earth? Uh, That's well, when, you, take... when you take no, no, a no. ship and you go east and west and you fall off the Earth there and you go on okay. to the other side on the bottom of it. I so guess. that, so Mr. Sergeant, that's what I'm yep. working with. Now you tell me what what is a flat Earth? A flat Earth is literally uh, the model I use is a giant planetarium. Uh, and a flat circular disc covered with some sort of dome. No different than the Truman Show, no different than a planetarium, 
uh, where you go in, you know, you go into any planetarium, the ones that are still out there, and you, you know, it's, it's circular, like a sports stadium. You look up, and the stars and the, the planets are in the sky, but you know they're not real. So in, in this model, imagine if you were in a planetarium that was thousands of miles wide. Could you hide an entire civilization in there, and how long could you hide them in there? And I believe that not only is it possible, but it's likely. And okay, so let's 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 together. back up a little bit so we can get these these little fine points in. What what made you believe? What made you start believing? Aside from I was really bored one day and I decided to look on the internet for the worst conspiracy theory I could find. Yeah. What made you start believing that uh, this is not a joke that it's it quite wasn't, possible this is happening. It wasn't that Again, and, and I'm going to be kind of uh, preaching this as I as I That's move forward right. with this, which is no. As I move forward, I'm going to. Keep, this is something new that I'm kind of working on. Which is, it's not that we're trying to prove the flat Earth. It's that we're disproving the globe. Because that's that's how I started believing it. It wasn't okay. it wasn't like I was trying to find. It was like, oh yeah, here's proof of flat Earth. Here's proof of flat Earth. No, what was happening was, is that I was going into mainstream science concepts. And I was finding out that they were wrong, or they were, or they were high, you know, severely lacking in content. And so, if you imagine um, a scale, you know, a set of scales where you have the flat okay. Earth on one side and the, and the globe on the other, well, the globe is very, very heavy, and and it's and it's got the advantage. But as you start tearing that down, and okay, when you actually, say tear it down, let's. I want to. I want to be real specific. So there's going to be a lot of little questions. Okay. Tearing it down. You mean the theory of a round globe. Yeah. When you remove most of the evidence, if not all, actually, evidence of the globe, those scales start to shift. Uh, and that's how I started believing in it, was I just started removing more and more evidence. Everything that, that every, you know, people that are listening to this now and uh, everything that you believe and everybody else has you know, grown up with is, is evidence for the globe. It isn't there. But and I there's want. more to this too. Um, yeah. They, what 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 I'm getting at is before the globe. So this isn't a new concept, I guess. Let me start over because there's a lot of people. <laughs> I read an article that there's a lot of people that don't believe the Titanic sank. Like they don't even know what the Titanic is, right? Sure. I'm sure. not uh, conspiracy theories aside. They they don't believe a ship sank in the ocean. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. But alone, they don't even believe that there was a ship that could possibly be that size, right? Sure. sure. And so with that said, there's a whole generation that's going to start looking into our history books and saying, oh, the Civil War never happened, you know, because it's not in history books anymore. Yeah. Um, they're taking it out, I think, this year or last year, they, they started to do this. And my point is that there's a whole generation, I think, that doesn't realize what you're talking about was an old it's an old concept it's not something like you're just making up for youtube no 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 it's it's not just an old concept it's the okay. oldest concept where did uh, that concept come from the original flat earth has been there since the beginning it was there before way before the round earth and i know some people are going to argue and say no 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 the round earth was was proposed in you know BC and stuff like that. It's like well, in some cultures, yeah, but the majority of them uh, believed that the Earth was flat. That was because from our eyes standpoint, with our limited uh, perception, that's what people thought. And you want to go back to some of the earliest stuff. You, you at least Americans can relate to. It's it's the uh, the Bible, which is Genesis Genesis one six that. There was a firmament when when God created the land and the ground. He created this firmament that separated the waters below, above and the waters below. And okay, so uh, there's a lot of people, atheists or, or not atheists, but there's a lot of people out there now. Now, and I yeah. the, the reason I, I cut you off at certain points is because I want to I want to make clear what you're saying. Sure. Um, sure. So there's a lot of. Uh, people out there that let's say don't believe in god anymore or you know yeah. there's a huge religious push with flat earth i've noticed okay just yes. by looking into it and i wanted to touch on that too but there is a lot of people now that 
don't believe in God, so they don't believe this firmament aspect of it. So I sure. guess, can you explain firmament? Well, the fir- I want to start from the beginning is basically what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it doesn't matter if you believe in you know, the firmament. The words have been there uh, you know, for, for a long time in, in every culture and every religion. And uh, yeah, I, I get it. I know with the new technological push, there's a, you know a growing group of people that aren't really spiritually based. But even in conservative estimates, 80% of the world's population is tied to one of the big five, you know, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. So the firmament is no, it is the description of the barrier, the, the dome that is over a flat world. So if you can think of the world as a dinner plate in terms of shape and, uh, perspective then the firmament would be like a like a cake cake plate that goes over the top of it you know a a semi-transparent but impermeable uh barrier that that covers us and it has been you know people have talked about it for a very very long time And, and again not just organized religions but also tribal uh instances all all over they you know, it's like the sky is painted and and of course that's what you would think it, you know if you if you don't have any sort of science behind you or anybody telling you anything different that's what you're going to see it's oh the st- stars are up there we don't know but they move what, what they are but they move across the sky and it looks like the the sky is this giant tapestry that's been kind of pulled over us and that is what the common belief was for most of our civilization, you know, if our if our civilization goes back five thousand years, you know, it, the history before it gets unbroken, the first forty five hundred of it, that's what the the bulk of our our population believed in, and then Copernicus, you know, in about fifteen hundred or so, uh, put this forward with with several other people. I mean, yeah, there were people before him that kind of mentioned it, but he was the guy that that made it popular, and that's where I started looking at it because it was an interesting concept to put forward basically so if you think the earth is flat so so for you before you continue before your your beginning of all of this started with copernicus it just didn't add up why we well, went yeah. from thousands of years in old way and all of a sudden we've changed yeah it yeah completely. it was a it was a massive leap of faith uh, and again especially since you're scientific i mean science was not in a, by any stretch advanced in 1500 so when you go from a flat stationary world that you don't know what's outside of to saying oh yeah by the way you know if I can work out the math and how the things travel across the sky if the earth is circular I'm sorry spherical and it spins at a thousand miles an hour and it spins around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour I I can I can you know I can show you how this is the, how the solar system works basically created the solar system uh, you know in a completely new way the problem was is that there was no way to prove it uh, and I know science says well you know the math proved it the math they kept going back to the math it's like yeah the math gave you a good basis for it technically but until you go until you are able to go up high enough to see it for yourself yeah but you- at one point we were saying the Earth was the center so everybody was like oh the earth is the center and, and now we're saying it's not so the math isn't always correct well i mean the science can't be always correct if they're like well no no the earth it's is not center and now it's not i mean now the sun it's, is. it's it's not and, and i'm i'd like to be absolutely clear and, and to say that look i'm not knocking science entirely you know science is, has gave us some some wonderful modern conveniences everything from air conditioning to high speed what you're internet. saying is they're not always right they're not always right. They, they take some guesses. You want a perfect example of that? Look at the, um, uh, the simple one is the core of the Earth. As we've all seen the, the cutaway drawing of the Earth, you know, with the bands of red and orange and yellow and white. Uh, and well, going, one, of the, one of the big things with, with science, though, is they're, they're, they, they say, you know what, I want to prove it wrong. You know, I guess that's because I've got I do have a friend that's a scientist. He's a biologist. You know, he works on uh, like I think vegetation around volcanoes and stuff like that. But, but anyway, um, you know, he's always saying, you know, he goes at it that, look, I want to prove this wrong. That's that's kind of his the, the way that I guess scientists think. They don't they're not out there to say, yeah, it's right. They're out there to say it's wrong. But then, you know, if they're proven wrong, 
then you know I guess they go with it but my my whole issue like let's let's get back onto science here because I want to hear what you have to say more importantly because I want to know how you got involved in this and sure. what what kicked you into thinking okay maybe there is meat behind this that is real i mean obviously it started with copernicus and it started Card start with, with copernicus um the big thing though that got me that got me really going i hate to say it was uh the footage the television footage from um, admiral bird where you know the admiral bird quick backstory you know he's the united states probably greatest explorer of all time uh, the youngest admiral in the United States Navy. He made admiral at 41, which is unheard of. And he was most known for the, the Hollow Earth legend, which, which goes back to 1926, where he took a rickety plane up to the North Pole and supposedly found an opening, and it was like on those journey to the center of the Earth things. But what's more interesting was is that, you know, he was more or less ordered, we don't know who his, who his backers were, down to the South Pole, down to Antarctica. And he's right, hold on, his... hold your thought, hold your thought. We've only got 15 seconds left in the show, you guys. You're listening to Humana Story Live's Coffee with Humana Story. This is episode 36, and we'll be back. Humana Story is the story of humanity, one person at a time. We believe each person has a story to tell, and each story shapes that person into who they are today. Collectively, and more importantly, each and every person's story shapes this little blue rock we call home. We are all together whether we like it or not. We also believe that your unique story might just help someone else traveling down your pathway in life. You might be their guide through this rough time. We are always looking for more exciting stories to share with the world. If you've got one, come share it with us today. Okay, so you're listening to Humana Story Live's Coffee with Humana Story, episode number 36, and we are in segment two. We were speaking with Mark Sargent, and I killed him. No, I didn't kill him. But he was talking about Admiral Byrd, and let's begin there. So, sure. <laughs> Admiral Byrd. Now, why, why, why do you have a hard-on for Admiral Byrd? Well, he's a good-looking man, for one. <laughs> I find I find older older in shape men quite virile. Well, he's, no. I got Mark's not in shape, but uh, <laughs> but he's old. No, no. What the thing with him was, uh, he was. It looked, for all intents and purposes, it was he was being sent on a mission somewhere down in Antarctica. You know, just looking around Antarctica, literally from 1928 all the way um, up to. Oh yeah, his but death. that goes without saying. I mean, the guy is an admiral in the military. If he's doing something, he's being told to. Of course, of course. But I think it was even beyond military. Whatever was going going on, he was he was being because again, you don't keep focusing. He was a world explorer. Why does he just stay in the snow for thirty years or twenty five plus years? Uh, you know, looking for something. So mm -hmm. he goes on television. The big thing was the and you and you can look it up. It's online, spread all over the place now, and it's in one of my clues, uh, clue two, the bird wall. Where he goes on television in 1954 on uh, a show, just sort of like a 60 Minutes type thing. Only then one of them was called the the Long Jeans uh, Chronoscope, which was uh, you know real easy. You can just look up Admiral Byrd television interview, and it's very very well done. You know, not a lot of people the video cassette recorders were quite a ways off then, so it was an affiliate that put this you know released it and, and put it online. And he goes on. And he's basically talking about Antarctica in, in some detail and his, you know, mission coming up. And, and he's so excited about it. He says, not only is it a great place for science, but it is a um, untapped natural resource uh, that, that needs to be exploited. It, that, it was basically made out of money, you know, an entire mountain range made out of coal and uh, uranium and oil and minerals and all this great stuff. And not only that, but there's nothing to worry about as far as... You know, there's no indigenous population, no tree, you know, plant life, no animal life. It's just snow and ice and rock. And 
he's talking about it, you know, and there's, they're getting ready for their next mission. This is 1954. The last mission was in 1955 called Operation Deep Freeze. And then after that mission, in fact, he was even worried about, you know, that there would be a struggle because there was a lot of nations down there. Uh, there, there wasn't just the United States that was down and there. By, by struggle, you mean that everybody uh, was going to tackle the same resources? Oh, uh, yeah, you're going to have fights. Resources. Okay. It was post-World War II. The Soviet Union needed to rebuild. Uh, United, United Kingdom needed to rebuild. You had Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, uh, okay, Australia. So they were all you were, you're, what you're saying is that he went down there and he found some massive resources, which... It, by any first world country, if they were to find these resources, the first thing they would do is put up the oil rigs, go down there, put up the tanks, yeah. get everything set up so they could take it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're going to. Yeah, yeah, you're going to set. Yeah, it, yeah, you're going to set up shop. I mean, we all know that this this yeah. world, our civilization, runs on money and power and greed, and money, you know, can get you in anywhere. And something changes, though. In, in the next year, they go down this mission, and then that was the last official mission. And what was the name of the mission? Operation Deep mission? Freeze. Okay. And that was that was the American side of the of the mission, where they found something, something that really really rattled them. And we know this because everything. Have you found any clues as to what rattled him? No, there's only one thing in my mind that could have rattled. And again, it didn't rattle just him. It well, no, I, I don't mean theory. I mean, have you have you researched out what made him No, no, change of course the course not. Because of, not yet? What, what, the, no one's ever going to, well, not until now, maybe. Because something like that, uh, you know, this is a secret to kill for. Uh, it, was, it was so big that everybody, every country... They all left the ice at the same time. These all these countries that were looking for resources and all this stuff, they all got off there like they were on fire. They got off there very, very quickly, and they started working on a treaty almost immediately. And it is and it was established, you know, it was first signed, I think, in 1959, a couple of years later. But it was called the Antarctic Treaty, and it's still in effect today, where it basically says every industrialized country, once you become some economically viable. Uh, as a as a trading company into the world, you are to sign this piece of paper saying you can't. None of your corporations can go down to Antarctica, ever. And it, it just boggled my mind because we all know there's corporations that can go anywhere they want. I mean, you know, the, the oil companies are are making headway and getting into national parks, and these are national parks, you know, protected areas. Yeah. And Antarctica wasn't a, wasn't a protected area, and. Now this is iron ironclad treaty that goes in and says nobody gets to go to Antarctica. Antarctica. You know, it's funny that you're mentioning this because I, I realize now that it was around the 60s when we started talking about global cooling, right? And in the 70s and 80s, it turned into global warming. Yeah. And now it's called climate change. Yeah. But, I mean, that would stop anybody, I mean... If I was trying to protect something, that's what, how, how I'd do it. Oh, well, sure, but but in 1959, environmentalism wasn't even a word, you know? No, but it, in I, 1960, that specific year is when they came out with global cooling. Hmm. So that's it's it's just interesting you. that you're mentioning this, him coming back. I mean, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm speculating, yeah. but it, that's, you know, that's granny S talk in the kitchen. I, so... So they, you know, the, the treaty is still in place today, which is also amazing. You know, it's the longest running treaty unilaterally. And again, it's not just the United States treaty. Every nation signed off to this. Uh, you know, the Russians, basically everyone that was down there in the ice at that point all agreed. You know, you all signed and said, nope, we're, we're not doing this. And you would have thought that after time, over time, that some of the bigger companies, as oil prices went up and up and, and, and energy resources became harder and harder to find, uh, that somebody would have somebody would have gotten involved and gotten in there, and nobody's broken the treaty, and that's not the part that really bothered me. What bothered me was, is that no one even talked about breaking the treaty. So, like, let's say you're the president of Exxon, right? You, you know how hard is it to call up your your buddies at the New York Times and start running a, a weekly piece saying why it's good for America for Exxon to go to Antarctica. And you don't see that. You don't see them lobbying. And lobbyists have so much power now. And they have, they have had for decades. Lobbyists don't, aren't even allowed to talk about it. So, again, it's one thing to, to stop all the biggest corporations. I mean, look, if a petroleum company wants to go into your backyard and start fracking, 
it's only a question of when. They can do it. Don't 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 think for a second they they can't. Well, they could do it tomorrow if they wanted to. I mean, you, you don't have the yeah. power to stop that. But, you don't have the but, money to stop it. But these companies, these same companies, don't have the power to go to Antarctica and and set up shop, even though there's nothing to step on. I mean, yeah, you find you could say, well, it's environmental. It's like, we're really, what, are you? Is there a tree down there that that we're not supposed to step on, or a, a bug, or a, a bird, or something? Fossilized soil. Uh, no, <laughs> whatever. And and you have to seal off an entire continent to do it. I mean, this thing's bigger than Australia, and okay. you're you're, you're sealing right, so off let's, millions. Let's pause right here, real quick, because yeah. So we're talking about Antarctica. We're talking yeah. about Admiral Byrd. Now, you yeah. originally said mm-hmm. to recap a little bit that what got you in this, what got you thinking about it was obviously originally you said that you were looking for something another another interesting thing to research yeah um and you ran across this but Mm -hmm. what got you hooked was you started looking at a time period where well the man never left the beach let alone went into space to copernicus didn't go into space to even know if it was round or not yeah um and somehow we adopted the globe model mm-hmm. and we did this based on the sciences at the time yeah. but as we're talking about it now science can be wrong yeah and that's what got you hooked is that little clinch right there which was yeah. here's a guy in the 1700s how can he say whether or not you know uh, the earth is round or flat when he has never even been in in C. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense. Okay. And, the, and then you're saying what, what pushed this even further as you were looking into this is if we skip ahead a few hundred years, you run into Admiral Byrd, uh, one of the most powerful men in the United States at the time in 1959. Yeah. What you're saying is this man went down to Antarctica and uh, I, I I say down because well you know yeah no it's all right if you if you turn the world upside down it'd be the top right so what if you were flying upside down in a spaceship I'm just yeah, saying exactly. so exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean you hear scientists say there's no orientation to it anyway so let's just say down we they go down mm-hmm. and uh, he comes back with a bewildered look on his face and uh, that's what got you hooked was an admiral in the military because the military and I'm sorry if anyone believes that they're nice they're wrong the military is there for a purpose that purpose is to kill period they're not out there doing research unless it's to how to kill that's it's the military that's what they do so he went down there and he comes back with a weird look on his face and that's what sunk you into flat earth is looking into all the aspects of how the situation with him yeah so this is a critical moment we're talking about with admiral bird are there any other critical moments what about all okay right after 1959 i think in 57 through i think it was the whole 60s and early 70s we had a whole wave of of ufos um, now I know some flat earthers say that there are none. Okay. And they're highly religious. What you're suggesting is this planet was created. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Yeah. And, it's going to, okay. Yeah. So by creating something, that means something had to create it. Something yeah. physical had to create either a flat plane or a ball. Yeah. Either way. So what I am asking you now is what I wanted to stop on that point with Admiral Byrd because I want to ask you what in your mind created this? How did that come into play? Because we were talking about the firmament before. So well, um, the ball, because of how we're, we're indoctrinated into our, you know, our thinking of that we're on a little ball in the middle of the solar system, in the middle of the galaxy, in the middle of the universe. We are, yeah, you can, the church on one side can say, well, you know, God made it, but 
but since it's seems... it exactly it goes further and further so well, exactly and and you know it's like okay it's a ball does that mean that it's that it's actual structure because we don't look at a, a sphere necessarily as as a structured built thing but if you come back and say no it looks more like a snow globe with an edge and a physical barrier up above well then that's got strict structure written all over it uh, and or at least very different structure than what we're used to because we build things like that you know ourselves you know of course not nearly as as huge and as as elegant and as refined but well, apparently you never saw star wars or the death star i'm just saying well you know yeah, oh. there's that <laughs> but the point is if there was an edge to this world the first thing is anybody would think is oh look you know it's it's proof of intelligent design it's the handprint of god now whether or but not that, it was built that's good right i mean i mean that doesn't stop our daily lives that's my whole point well it does i mean i you think actually, it would oh god yes it, it, stop mine, people actually. i i get i get messages every week you know from people again it's just smaller thinking which is like why would i care you know i still have to go to my crappy job in the morning and it's yeah. like, yeah, you would until one day you probably wouldn't because all that's going to change. Uh, in, and I'll, I'll skip forward to something, which is if there was proof of intelligent design, then I guess that's that... what we're saying here is, is you, you believe that it's intelligently designed. Oh, absolutely. I don't think organically you can put up then a giant... What do you make on this? Okay, because this is the same time period as... As uh, as Admiral Byrd doing his stuff, you know, in 1942, I think it's February 1942, L.A. had a massive UFO sighting, and yeah. I don't, I, I call it UFO. I'm gonna make this really clear for any of you space nuts out there. UFO means unidentified flying object. It just means they didn't know what it was, but they did fire on it. They thought it was the Japanese, and it went up and down the southern coast. And it was all over the radio. It was there are pictures of it. You can see it. It was a broadcast that was huge, and uh, it went from L.A. to San Diego. I think it was February. And anyone can correct me on the date and time, and you can tell Mark because I'm not sure if he's aware of this. But for literally a half hour, this whole thing, you know, went on. So, but again, this went on around the same time frame. Admiral Byrd is doing his thing. So my question to you is, is do, you, do you think that maybe there's a correlation with this if, in fact, it is an intelligent design? And if it is uh, an intelligent design, then there's got to be something more to it. Well, I mean, I, I've changed my view on what UFOs are over the years because okay. if it is an enclosed system then I believe the UFOs aren't necessarily coming from you know, distant planets because there are no distant planets. That They're coming from either outside the structure or they are part of older civilizations or remnants of civilizations that were here before us. Okay, so uh, this brings me to, to a question mm -hmm. about space. Yeah. Is there space around us? or I mean, is it possible to have a flat Earth and still be going around a sun? Why? That, that, that's been my argument since day one and that is if you're faking space if you're inside a planetarium that's creating the illusion of space it's probably because space isn't actually outside of there that okay, is something... are you suggesting that earth is in a Truman like closed in structure yeah on a much bigger land yes that's exactly what I'm suggesting uh, okay. we are a big Studio, you're in a big sound stage on an even bigger back lot with probably more sound stages. Okay, so uh, let's that's... get back with Admiral Bird. I just I wanted to be clear to to end this properly. Sure. Uh, you know, we're, this isn't this is going to be an ongoing thing, and we'll do this every Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, again, Copernicus is what got you in. Admiral Bird is what locked you in. Yeah. And I really want to hit on this. This that I I want to call them aliens for all intents and purposes, ET, extraterrestrials, or evil and terrifying, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> but I want to, if it's intelligent, do you believe it's intelligent design? Yeah, I absolutely okay, believe. It's so, which means you believe that something created it. Yes. yes. Now, what that is, you're not sure of, right? Uh, yeah, it can really only be one of two things but uh, either in advanced civilization or a magical being you know, throwing lightning uh, well yeah or yeah or okay. divine power but really 
you know, then you're kind of blurring the lines there because God would also be seen as some sort of advanced being. And, and uh, I don't really want to split hairs when it comes to theology. So, Well, the reason why I ask that is because that, that seems like a crucial, like to me, every time I, I look into this, every time I start going deeper um, into looking into it, it, I see there's always a touch of religion. Now, I've tried to talk to Robert Skiba, but I think he's a he's a busy man. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because I can't seem to get a hold of the guy, but I wanted to ask him about religion. Mm-hmm. Um, now he talks about uh, an ancient race of people that were really tall and big, and I mean I don't know too much about religion to the the Nephilim, honest, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wanted to know if, what his what you know you think that they could have been you know. A, yeah, yeah, they they could have been involved in this, which was, or could they be the reason why we're in an enclosed system? Because lots of people will say, well, you know, there's there's evidence of, you know, old civilizations all over the place. But the eventual question comes up, it's like, okay, who were the first tenants to rent this apartment? You know, who were the original people that got in here? And a lot of people keep pointing back to the legend and the myth of, or whatever you want to call it of the fallen ones, you know, that, that, you know, the story, if you look in the Christian side, you know, the fallen angels. Uh, you know, that were that were cast down to earth. But see, now that's the thing. I hear a lot about the fallen angels, and a lot of people say it sounds like aliens. I mean, it's it's. Well, yeah, I mean, it's I mean, you, one, it, one it, there's a cross between angels and aliens and spirituality, and it, it. Yeah, yeah. One person's demon is another person's uh, alien, uh, or yeah, or angel. I, so. And I, it's like, how how can you get to the bottom of that? That's because you've you've got to in order to understand the big picture of what's going on it's like us looking at a puzzle a thousand piece puzzle and only seeing one piece yeah you know it, and trying to make the the whole picture off of just that piece it, it's impossible yeah um so here's what i offer everybody because we're, we're getting ready to uh end the show for today is if there's any questions any beginner questions that anyone has I know this is going to go on Mark Sargent's YouTube page, so please, please write intellectual questions regarding the beginning of this. Help me understand it. If you're a troll, you'll be ignored. But if you're honest to God, trying to carry on a serious, real conversation like a normal human being, I would like to understand. So... Mark, thanks for being on the show. We'll have you next oh, yeah. Friday, and uh, yeah. you have much love. Hey. Humana's story is the story of humanity, one person at a time. We believe each person has a story to tell, and each story shapes that person into who they are today. Collectively, and more importantly, each and every person's story shapes this little blue rock we call home. We are all together whether we like it or not. We also believe that your unique story might just help someone else traveling down your pathway in life. You might be their guide through this rough time. We are always looking for more exciting stories to share with the world.